Hello, and welcome to episode 84 of Awesome Astronomy for June 2019. We stand on the shoulders of giants, which is a good thing, because I'm only 8 five foot seven. But of course, while Newton was on the one hand taking a swipe at the diminutive Robert, so she's my niece, what are you all staring at, Hook? He was also describing the notion that science is built like a tower of ever-increasing height, each layer built on the foundations of the previous. And so it is with the anniversary of the day, where, on the 29th of May 1919, the physics of the 17th century was supplanted by the physics of the 20th. 300 years of work, layer upon layer, Newton laying the foundation stone, others such as Maxwell raising the view ever higher until we get to Einstein. And why the 29th of May 1919? Well, this is the day of that solar eclipse. The day when Arthur Eddington, perhaps the first astronomer to truly grasp what Einstein had written down, takes a picture which is the first evidence that general relativity is more accurate description of the universe than we've ever had. Eddington, an Englishman, proving a German correct just months after the armistice and paving the way for much of modern astronomy. With contemporaries such as Henrietta Swan-Levitt, Edwin Hubble and of course Georges Lemaitre, the scene is set for a century of discovery that takes us from a constant unchanging universe limited to the stars we see to a universe of apparent limitless size and wonder. Not bad for a glass plate and 6 minutes and 51 seconds of feverish activity. And proving that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, it must be time to introduce my co-hosts, a pair whose podcasting gravity would cause many a star to shift position, the looping solar prominence that is Jenny. Cooey! And the coronal mass ejection that is Ralph. Don't come in now! Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hello. 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 That was, uh, I didn't realise that it was an anniversary, a centenary. Centen- I know. Centenary. It's centen- awesome. Yeah. It is. It is mm. an awesome one. You know, actually, it was Jenny that reminded me of this earlier today. I I had made a note of it last a uh, couple of weeks ago. I thought, oh, yeah, must must work that into the episode I'm doing the script. And then completely forgot about it. <laughs> and I literally I wrote that this afternoon when Jenny sent a message going, oh, do you realise it's the anniversary of, of Arthur, of the the solar eclipse people. I'm like oh, of course it is um, that's what I was going to write about so how have you both been? Busy Pint Science happened this month Sorry can I interrupt there just before you go into your, what you've been up to yeah. Is it not the Matra? That's what he said wasn't it? No he said something else weird La Matra? La, La, it wasn't La Matra He's Belgian nobody cares Oh he'll be fine It's like Kuiper Kuiper Cooper Tomato Smarto yeah, I literally, I am, I am starting to call it the Cooper Kuiper belt. Cooper Kuiper, <laughs> because I it, nobody seems to be able to agree on on the how. I go it's for Kuiper. Yeah, I I used to say Kuiper all the time, and then loads. I, I can't remember which astronomer I was working with said Cooper all the time. I was like, oh, is it Cooper? Yeah. I didn't realise. I always used to say Cooper, and then and people then... in the department started saying Kuiper, so I was like, oh, okay, I'll switch to Kuiper. Yeah, you see, but I, I really got... feel like it's tomato tomato at this stage. Uh, well, really does anybody is. want to tell me how we should be saying Edmund Halley? Halley, I, I say Halley. Yeah, but it's Hawley. It's actually the, the a lot of it the is evidence. Hawley. Is, it's Hawley. Is it Hawley? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Everyone says Halley because oh. that's kind of what everyone settled on. But it, it is Hawley. Mm. Yeah, and all that means is it really doesn't matter. No, it's exactly. only pedants that care. Exactly. You say tomato, I say you're wrong. So, um, what have you been up to? And Jenny, I, we, we've got to ask, did you get the eight and a half months preggers on the infrared camera? No. You didn't get one turning up? No, no one turned up. Not even in the name of science? Not even in the name of science, but we did get a very, very good boy called Henry, who was a 13-year-old dog. Little Shih Tzu. Ooh. We had him on the infrared camera. That was pretty cool. And was he pregnant? <laughs> Decidedly not. <laughs> he was a very good boy, so we took his picture and printed it off for him. You're telling me on the whole of Cardiff you could not find <laughs> someone pregnant to drag in and just like take a piss. Like, stand there! I'm pretty sure there are lines. Paul, I still think I could just wander the streets of Cardiff going, you, you are pregnant, come with me. 
Why not? That's what scientists used to do exactly. in Victorian days. <laughs> and when the rosers come, you can go like, back off, man. I'm a scientist. It's, it's a science. science. Yeah. No, it went really well, though, quite science. <laughs> yeah, how did we it go? We sold out every night. You did, Apart didn't from, you? Well, we didn't sell one ticket on the Tuesday, but then we sold one too many tickets on Wednesday. So I feel like that averages out to we sold out every night. Cool. Yeah, cool. it went and really di- well. And did everyone enjoy it? Yeah, we had really good feedback. So we had uh, teeny tiny feedback forms with, you know, ratings one to five. Mm-hmm. And I would say 95% of them were fours and fives. Cool. So, yeah, it went really well. And you know most of those fours or fives because people hate putting top marks for anything. Mm. Yeah. They, they, they feel yeah. like that's, like, even if they completely enjoy themselves and it's the most awesome thing ever, they'll say, oh, yeah, but I can't put five because that's a bit, like, uh, I'll put a four. Yeah, so, yeah, you know so we were five. really pleased. Yeah. Awesome. Did you get any listeners turning up? We got new listeners. Oh. Hello. Because I hosted, yeah, hello, if there is anyone actually listening who went to Pint of Science, because a few people told me, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to sign up to the podcast, and saw oh. them on the subsequent nights, and they were like, oh, yeah, I've signed up to your podcast, so hello. Hello, new listeners. Welcome. This is the place for you. Yeah. Mm. You have to get your own beer, though. We haven't got a bar. Yeah. <laughs> we sure are working about. on it, though. Yeah. And the old listeners, come on, pull your fingers out. Oh yeah. <laughs> get the get the beers in. <laughs> so anything else before we I missed the SpaceX launch despite being in Florida. Idiot. How did you do that? Because I was stupid and I wasn't thinking about it. I was there <laughs> for work and uh I was in a bar because it was the evening, it was about what half ten, eleven o'clock, something like that, and looked up at the T V screen and noticed that there was a launch happening in the same state, probably about eighty miles away, something like that. You so idiot. remembering that during the Saturn V days that people could see it all the way over in Louisiana or something, um, decided to rush out of the bar, use the compass on the phone to look at look for the right direction so that I could look for a gap in between the buildings. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, saw it as a kind of little star rising up in the sky. It was probably about a minute into the launch, so I could see it going up, and you could tell it was kind of like an elongated star, but um, couldn't get a picture of it because it wouldn't focus on it because it was about a minute into the launch by that point and getting quite fady fady but um <laughs> so i saw a bit of it um but i think we'll probably talk a bit more about that later yeah yeah let's not mention the payload yet <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah you should have been there and you should have shot calm, it down calm calm <laughs> let's go back to zen calm we're all friends here <laughs> well i'll talk about a happy thing my paper went off for its first round with uh the collaborators and the powers that be. Cool. Is it a dusty paper? Yeah. yeah, sort of. It's using dust to measure gas in galaxies. Further in human knowledge. Yeah. So when it's out, do we get to put it in the news? Oh my God, yes. Yes. Yes, awesome. <laughs> yes we do. <laughs> but I feel like I shouldn't summarise it. I feel like one of you two should summarise it. Happy to. To see yeah. how readable it actually is. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, it'll be a few months yet because this is only the first round and I've already had like a bunch of things. People are like, oh, have you looked at this? Oh, maybe you should do that. Oh, this would be a really interesting plot. And some of them have been great. And then some of them have been like, oh, I really think you should reference my papers. <laughs> <laughs> Citations are everything. <laughs> yeah. It It is like social media, isn't it? You, yeah, you, you can tell that it was it was scientists and engineers that came up with social media. Yeah, like it's my def- thing, like yeah. my thing. <laughs> so, how long before you're published? Before it goes out, mm. it'll be a few months yet. What? What's what's a few months? Uh, where are we? May, probably September. Oh, mm, I, was I cool. reckon. Cool, cool. Right, we're looking forward yeah. to it. Cool. And at that so, point, we will have a new story where we can say. Furthering the extent of human knowledge in this paper by Jen Millard. Jenny! Yeah. yeah. Not since the days of Einstein. <laughs> we're building. We're going to build this up. We're going to. We're yeah. going to have. We're going to have a hell of an introduction for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then you know, if anyone wants to cite it in their paper, <laughs> would not say no to that either. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like my thing, like my thing. Like anyway, my thing. Should we move on to the emails? Yeah, let's do that. Let's move on to the emails. Okay. Um, 
Our good friend Andy Burns um, wanted to correct our pronunciation in a previous episode when we were talking about the amount of data collect to uh, create that tiny couple of hundred kilobyte image of M87 supermassive black hole. Um, Andy says, hello, overlords, two things. Petabytes are pronounced petabytes or petabytes. I think Petrobytes is a falafel shop from Jordan. (laughs) (laughs) I blame the gin. Secondly, yeah, the bandwidth for this data is staggering and reminded me of the Andrew S. Tannenbaum quote, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the highway. (laughs) And uh, yeah, so (laughs) the origin of this is that Jen mentioned Petrobytes and because I'm so dumb... I didn't correct her. I thought I'll. I didn't just even realise I said petabytes. <laughs> I'm going to be honest because I know it's petabytes or petabytes. Yeah. Like I, I know it's definitely not petabytes. So I entirely blame the gin for that one. So sorry, yeah. folks. And I got overawed by your magnificence, Jen, and thought, well, that must be something that I wasn't a unit of measure. I wasn't aware <laughs> of. I even tried to edit it out, but Andrew's far too eagle-eared. Yeah, I will a hundred percent take uh the blame and place it squarely on kevin's on the shoulders <laughs> who bought us the gin at we Camp. can't keep blaming him for i can and i will we will until somebody else buys us gin yeah I, I i would say wasn't that like an episode before that the gin yeah, it's two episodes ago right mm. uh so this is two mm. episodes ago right okay it's yeah. the gin then mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it's say, the otherwise gin. that's a hell of a hangover <laughs> <laughs> Right, and now if it's all right with you, the news. Jenny. My first story is an update of some results from... Oh, shit, I went to Google how to pronounce this. Akatsuki. Akats- Akatsuki? Mm-hmm. Akatsuki. It, it, it's all, all the English of Japanese words or Chinese words are always going to be phonetic because they're not in the right alphabet. Oh, so that's a good fact. They're always going to be phonetically pronounced because they're not actually spelt like that. Yeah, no, of course. My first story is an update some results from Akatsuki, otherwise known as the Venus Climate Orbiter and NASA's IRTF, or the Infrared Telescope Facility. Now, between 2016 and 2018, the mission studied the night side, kind of mid to lower clouds of Venus, and they found a huge, rich variety of cloud morphologies never seen before. Now, I could spend the next 10 minutes describing in detail all the different types of cloud that they found, but I'm not going to do that to you guys. (laughs) Briefly, they found billows and vortices, streaks and bands, belts, blotches and troughs. The same phenomenon as previously found on the day side. Now, The key bit of this research is that this confirms that Venus does have planetary-wide atmospheric effects and they are eerily similar to those that you can find on Earth. This is a stark reminder of the perils we face if we don't get our climate under control. Now, the true beauty of this research really does lie in the images that they've released. And if you can, I very much encourage you to go and look up this paper on the archive. The first author is Jay Peralta, and if anyone's a fan, I will shout 99, and people will know what that means. Lost on me. Have you yep. ever seen Brooklyn Nine-Nine? No. no. Okay, well, one of the detectives in Brooklyn Nine-Nine is called Jake Peralta. Aha. Aha. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 See, fans will be sat there going 99, they'll be, it'll be good. <laughs> if, you, if you know what the TV show is if you don't it's completely lost to you anyway the name of the paper is New Cloud Morphology Discovered on the Venus Night during Akatsuki cool so next story Tess is at it again and has discovered mm. a compact multi-planet system around a naked eye star da mm. that is cool mm-hmm. so we can go out and see this star and know that there's planet around it well, yeah. planets around it. We can't, because we can't see it from the UK. Oh, I know. I mean, Mars, Mars, Mars. Our latitude on Mars. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. You guys will be all right. You can just hop in the buggy and drive around, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for us in the UK, 
we've got issues. But for any of our Southern Hemisphere listeners, it's pretty fair game. The star is called HR 858 and it lies in the constellation of Fornax and it's magnitude 6. So it is really on the edge of naked mm. eye. But if you get to, you know, a proper dark sky site, you should be able to see it. Cool. The star is 32 parsecs away and it's a late F type star. And, you know, if having multiple planets around it wasn't enough, it's a visual binary. Oh, Yay. like Alcor and Mizar. Mm. So. There are three known planets in this system, and all of them are about twice the size of Earth. So, if you're down south, why not check it out? Mm. Next up, some news about Proxima Centauri b. Now, this planet was discovered using Doppler spectroscopy. Uh, That is, splitting up the light from Proxima Centauri, um, then kind of looking for regular shifts in any absorption lines that might be in the spectrum. And the shifts in the spectral lines are caused by the star moving about its common centre of mass, and instead of it sitting at the sort of middle of the center of mass it's off center from the center of mass because there's a planet orbiting it kind of like a whole you know seesaw situation now from the radial velocity method or doppler spectroscopy we can figure out uh, how long the planet takes to orbit the star and also its mass relative to proxima centauri because uh, the amount of shift depends on the ratio of the mass compared to the, of the star compared to the mass of the planet. However, mm. we can't figure out its size. Now, there have been previous claims of detected transits of this planet, but James Jenkins from Universidad de Chile and his team used the Spitzer Space Telescope to study the star during the expected transit times, which they know from the Doppler spectroscopy. And they found nothing. Zero. Zilch, zip, nada. Hmm. Spitz operates in the infrared, and these detections seem to be less sensitive to flares and stellar activity. So, if we were going to find these transits, it was going to be this way. The study means that the planet must have a radius less than 0.4 times that of Earth's. Otherwise, they should have found it. Now, they believe that previous work from optical telescopes were probably correlated noise from flares. What this does mean for the planet, that it's probably really tiny. And is it even habitable at this size? Probably not. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, mm. for all my news stories, I've kind of stayed reasonably local within our galaxy. But for my final story, I'm expanding my horizons and I'm leaving. I'm going to our nearest neighbours. <laughs> Philip Massey from Lowell Observatory and his team reported on some quasars hidden, quite frankly, in plain sight. Massey found 11 new quasars hidden behind the stellar disks of M31 and M33. (laughs) I know! And you may know these as the Andromeda Mm. and Triangulum galaxies. So you're staring at them all the time if you're Mm. um, an astronomer. Yeah, exactly. The redshifts of the quasars range anything from 0.37 to 2.15. So this is kind of between the universe being 3 billion years old and like 9.5 billion years old. They also found five background galaxies hidden behind these galaxies. Now, wow. what, I know. And it makes sense, right? Because these galaxies are huge on the sky. They are probably going to be hiding stuff behind them. But I think mm. it's amazing they've actually detected these things. But what I really like about this study is that they were kind of discovered serendipitously. They were actually found during studies to try and find red supergiant stars and massive stars in the two galaxies using images of the galaxies at uh, different optical wavelengths and by also taking spectra of the galaxies. And the quasars were identified by the presence of really strong, broad UV emission lines redshifted into the optical wave band. So there's wow. no doubt that these are quasars. Mm. That's just really cool. Hidden in the galaxies. I that's know. really cool. Yeah, I like that. I thought it was cool. Yeah, that that's amazing because actually Andromeda would be such a massive, well, a, a, a patch of interference in that kind of observation. Uh huh. Huge thing. Wow. And that's yeah. a really interesting way of finding it as well, because mm. I thought you were going to say that they used lensing to bend the light around the, the galaxy and see what was behind it. Nope, just optical images and some spectroscopy. Cool. Mm. cool. Yeah, I thought it was cool. Right then. 
Ralph, what do you got okay. for us? Well, it's been a busy month in astronomy, as you can probably tell from, I think, is that four news stories you you, you, you had there, Jen? Yeah, I had um, four. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quickly round up the rest of the discoveries or research that's piqued our interest. And that starts with the most significant piece of solar system detritus, Pluto. Because researchers, led by a team at the University of Hokkaido in Japan, have followed up on the interesting basins that were discovered uh, on the surface of Pluto by the New Horizons spacecraft in 2015. Uh, you'll remember uh, all those features that stood out. Some looked like the, the was it the dog Pluto, the, the yeah from Disney cartoon dog, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The, the most the most famous one was the the the, the really big Sputnik Planitia. Um, and the reason that this research um, was done was to look into that kind of speculation around the time of could there be a subsurface ocean um, on Pluto, given that it's so far away and so cold. Um, so the, the team ran a series of computer simulations on ice-like molecules with gas-filled cavities that's known as gas hydrates. And that showed that a layer of these gas hydrates under the ice sheet of Pluto's Sputnik Planitia Basin could insulate an ocean underneath, which opens up the possibility of other oceans on worlds considered to be too cold for liquid water too. And of Ooh. course, liquid water is the thing we're looking for around the solar system and, and in other solar systems too. But it might mean that there, just like we, we were surprised about seeing liquid methane on Titan, that there could be other places where there is liquid if not on the surface but under the surface it's really interesting as well for life elsewhere yeah it kind of really expands that sort of quote unquote habitable zone yeah it's it's all changed in the last 10 years really isn't it this yeah and it's all down to the instruments and Mm. the, the 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 exploration that we do yeah cool Cool. Then we have the probing of ice deposits on Mars by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which used radar to look under the North Polar region at the structure and composition of the sand bed. And it's actually very rich in an ice, which is likely left over from a previous ice cap that was eroded during a warmer era in Mars's past. So mm-hmm. not only is this a look at the evolving climate picture on Mars, but it also suggests there's a polar cap on top of a former polar cap. Oh, do you reckon that's going to happen on the Earth? So when the first one disappears, we'll magically get a second one. Maybe. Well, ours have disappeared in the past. The definition of an ice age on Earth is that polar caps even exist. Is it? Oh, so we're like in an ice age now. So we're like right at the end of an ice age anyway. They Mm. they do vanish. Don't say things like that because now the the climate climate naysayers are going to be like, look, we're still in an ice age. We're not Uh, warming up. it's, It's all about the pace of change. It's mm-hmm. all about the pace of change. And they need to get over themselves. CO2 <laughs> tipping points. Yeah. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, can I just, a little aside, just quickly, because it just amused me. Yesterday, my my uh, my wife said, is this is this what you call the naturalistic fallacy? And it was somebody, um, someone was saying about cleaning products online. And mm-hmm. someone said, oh, you shouldn't use sort of chemicals. You should use, you know, to protect the environment, you should use bicarbonate soda and vinegar to clean things. Hmm. I said, yeah, basically that that's kind of this this idea of something that appears to be natural is better. Is but really the better, irony yeah. being, of course, the reaction between bicarbonate soda and vinegar releases carbon dioxide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just I, I just I, it, was, it was a bunch of people trying to claim environmental credentials by releasing more CO two. That amused <laughs> me. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> and they'd be horrified like to know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but well, we told them anyway. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> So next up, scientists are hoping a simple process could help them detect dark matter particles easier and more cheaply than the big experiments that are currently finding the square root of f*** all. <laughs> By super cooling... Wa- <laughs> so by super cooling water in, a, in what they're calling a snowball chamber to well below its freezing point, researchers hope to detect dark matter interactions that cause the liquid to rapidly turn to ice and it sounds like pseudoscience but this does come from research presented in last month's meeting of the american physical society so you know it might not be nonsense it is so a bit like those videos that you've probably seen where physics students super cool water which stays a liquid until you tap or bang the bottle researchers think that subatomic particles can trigger freezing in supercooled liquids 
in an even greater stretch of reality, because dark matter behaves a bit like a neutron, we think, if engineers <laughs> can eliminate neutrons from their snowball chamber, which isn't going to be easy, when a dark matter particle passes through the Earth and the snowball chamber, it'll make the supercooled liquid freeze, and we should see it as an amazing YouTube video just a few short days afterwards. We won't. <laughs> you know this thing with the, like, supercooling water and then freezing it? Yeah. I, I did that accidentally on holiday once. Accidentally? Was, yeah, yeah. Oh, Seriously, cool. Seriously, we were skiing in Austria, and um, so, you know, bought some drinks, and we were just like, oh, yeah, leave it out on the balcony for an hour, because, you know, why use a fridge when it's minus 20 outside? Yep. And um, it was actually a bottle of arm doodler, which, if you've never had it, is the best soda that has ever been created by man. And um, <laughs> went to open it, and, yeah, like, you know, cracked it open, and it just started freezing. Like, all the way down. And then yeah. it was just well, that, solid that ice. that shows the purity inside the liquid then. Mm. Mm. It's it a very was, cool thing to do. It was brilliant. And it was completely by accident. Cool. And then we had a bottle of water out there and we were like, oh, shit, I wonder if it'll work with the water. It didn't work with the water. It works with the arm doodler. So, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Anyway. Now, a snowball chamber is something entirely different in my mind. Go on. Are you on the Urban Dictionary? Possibly. <laughs> dirty, dirty man. Well, you know what snowballing is, don't you? Mm-hmm. I think I'd erased it from my mind, but it's I he don't. came back in. Oh, don't, don't, Jen, don't, don't. Tell me, enlighten me, John. What's snowballing? Why don't you show her? <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn the Skype video on. <laughs> I don't have to be involved in this, do I? No, no. no. <laughs> No, you're there. Give him a hand. Go on then, John. Tell her what snowballing is. <laughs> um, it, it's the passing of fluids from one person to another. By what mechanism, John? <laughs> Orally. What fluids would these be? Special fluids. <laughs> <laughs> that only a mummy and daddy share. <laughs> the mummies, mummies and daddies yeah. and daddies and daddies share, yes. <laughs> a chamber for this you say well <laughs> <sighs> so finally the race is on to analyse meteorite samples at Arizona State University's Centre for Meteorite Studies after a carbonaceous chondrite meter about the size of a washing machine broke up and peppered a small town in Costa Rica on the 23rd of April why Ooh. a race? well because many carbonaceous chondrite meteors, including these samples, are 80 to 90% clay and often contain water and organic mm. compounds for analysis. If they get rained on, they get contaminated or just break up. But the uh, university managed to get... Huh? No, I was just, I was just going, ah. Uh, that's all. Ooh. Yes, you know, a noise ooh. of interest. Don't start that again. <laughs> <laughs> But the university managed to get hold of plenty of samples and are now analysing them for their oxygen isotopes, which helps determine what characteristics this meteorite shares with others and determining the organic inventory of the sample to look for insights into whether these types of meteorites provided the ingredients for the origins of life on Earth. And, if you're interested, no one was hurt as the meteorites descended, but a small dining room table will never be the same again. Yeah, it's a good picture Aww. of it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great story. It's that whole thing of one of the reasons we know we need to go and do sample return missions and actually go to asteroids and things like that and grab these things is because the the extreme contamination that happens as they enter Earth yeah. and land. Mm. So and also, the, we know the provenance if we go and get it, mm. whereas we only guess at the provenance of mm. them or don't know at all if, mm. um, if it arrives as a meteor. Yeah, but while there's, there's loads of work they can do with meteors, there is still a limit. There's a limit because of the basically the instant contamination from from hitting the atmosphere and, and crashing into yeah. the ground, and, and then how long they're mm. on the ground. And the, so, but this is great. This is a sort of you know rare event. It's really cool. Mm. Be interested to see what what comes out of that one. Okay, now, dear listener, I think I can call you that now. We, we've known each other for a while. <laughs> um, I'm going to put in a health warning here for our big story this month. Um, Brace yourself. It, it's about a certain satellite system recently launched by Mr. Elon Reeve Musk. Now, you may have noticed 
that it's caused a certain amount of, let's call it discussion, within the astronomy community. My advice is pause the podcast now, pour a drink, maybe pie <laughs> sharp and pointy objects, perhaps grab a favourite soft toy to hold. Turn the volume down a touch. Please don't think me a coward as I retire to a safe distance upon unleashing a certain Welsh astronomer. Okay, everybody? Right then, Jenny. Starlink, tell us what you think. I'm going to do my best to stay calm. It's fine. No, you don't have to stay calm. You, you carry on. I'm going to stand over there. <laughs> right. Starlink. It's a satellite constellation project uh, by SpaceX to implement a new space-based internet communication system. Um, he plans in total to have 12,000 of the little buggers up in the sky in three orbital shells by the mid-2020s. Um, he's going to have 1,600 at about 550 kilometres above the surface of the Earth, uh, 2,800 at about 1,100 kilometres up, and he's going to have 7,500 at about 340 kilometres up. So very nearby, one might say. Total cost, 10 billion US dollars, that is. Um, and there hasn't been, this has sort of been ticking away in the background for a little while. Uh, but there were big motions um, with this on the 24th of May this year when uh, he launched 60 of them and Ralph could have stopped him, but he chose not to. We'll uh, come back to that later. <laughs> the saboteur okay. attempt failed. I'm going to do my best to try and give both arguments for Starlink because I will freely admit that on the face of it, Starlink is a great idea. Sort of, you know, the ability for everyone around the world to access high-speed internet, right? That's great. Could lift people out of poverty, could improve communications in terms of security. I'm definitely not saying these through grated teeth at all. <laughs> Can I just... Before you carry on, on our yeah. script, I just want to kind of put this, put the context here. On our script, <laughs> we have a little note that says like the biggie story, biggie for all, for everyone to discuss. <laughs> and last night, next to it, in <laughs> in capital shouty Twitter kind of foil tin hat kind of fat flat earther styled capitals, um, someone has written. <laughs> burger starling <laughs> and it wasn't me and it wasn't me it must have been john then because why would i say such because you're a lady i'm a lady i do not say such words because you're a lady you wouldn't say anything so awful as <laughs> burger starling and i'm saying that again because ralph's got to bleep all this out <laughs> <laughs> but carry on i just wanted to sort of give give everybody a little bit of context as to why i'm standing <laughs> why i'm very glad the river seven is between us <laughs> okay back to the good things about starlink for the general public this is going to be great this is going to be amazing however for the astronomer and uh i would argue that i'm an astronomer before i'm a member of the public <laughs> uh i'm not too happy about this for several reasons I think the thing that annoys me most is that Elon could have gone about this by consulting astronomers and he could have done this in a way to not ruin the skies for us, basically. Um, so Why there's... would this ruin the sky for us, Jim? Pray tell. Okay. There are two main areas of concern. One from optical astronomers, for obvious reasons, you're going to see them. We'll come back to that one afterwards. And the second group who are very concerned are radio astronomers. Now, radio waves are obviously used by communication satellites and, um, you know, all around the globe, all up in space, all in low Earth orbit, right? But there are certain bands and frequencies that are um, allocated for radio astronomy um, by the EU with international agreements and they are to be kept clear of radio transmissions so that radio astronomers can detect faint signals from cosmic sources in the radio. Why can't we just put radio telescopes in space? Well, Elon, if you're listening, uh, you can't put every telescope up into space. Radio telescopes, by their nature, are huge. They have to be huge because in order to get any sort of resolution, the longer the wavelength you're looking at, the bigger your telescope needs to be. Now, 
I will say that these bands are used also for communications. So what I'm hoping is that the actual specific bands protected for astronomy are not being used by Elon and there's a little bit of a mix-up because if he does use these bands for communication between your satellites going up and down to Earth, what he's essentially done is whitewash the sky and still expected radio astronomers to be able to do their thing. Which, of course, is impossible. That's not going to happen. Given that they've been up there for a week, has radio astronomy gone dead? I don't know. No one has said they've had any I problems I think you yet. would know. I think, I think, to be fair, there's only 60 yeah. of them up there and they're not entirely active yet. Would be, yeah. Would be my, my reply to that. As a sort I of... would also be very surprised if he doesn't have um, band gaps in there. That mm. if, I would be surprised if they're not filtering at those frequencies because spectrum is a commodity like anything else and it's incredibly expensive. And if you're using illegal spectrum... It's going to cost you a fortune, and NASA wouldn't let him launch them in the first place if they were doing anything that was restricted. So I, I, I don't this think is that's why... going to be an issue. But I don't think, it's not that I know, I don't think that. Yeah, this is why I'm exercising caution, because on paper, it looks like he does have overlaps. However, would he actually be that much of an asshole? I like to think not. Um, and I also like to think that, you know, the EU... And just the the international community in general would would not let him actually occupy the bands used by radio astronomy. They'd find him out of existence. Yeah, well, you'd hope so. Um, there are like rumours on the mill that radio astronomers are banding together to protest, but that is obviously in the very early stages, and I have no idea where that's going. So I don't really want to comment on that too much further. I'd like to know they've got their facts right first because this is, is yeah. all just so much Twitter uh, outrage to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we have to be really, really careful but the radio astronomers are very concerned and um, radio, and well, astronomers in general don't like people and they don't like keeping kicking up a fuss if they can avoid it because they like to keep themselves to themselves and squirrel away and kind of do astronomy. Uh, so the fact that so many people are kind of speaking up does kind of raise a little red flag for me. However, I do think you're right. I would be very surprised if Elon is actually occupying illegal bands. So hopefully he's just using the bands which are in those regions, which are already being used for communications and are not being used for radio astronomy. Okay, so the other wavelength, we've got the optical. Um, and I think this is the one that kind of hits home to kind of amateur astronomers and astrophotographers. Um, there has been real concern about how, just simply how bright the 60 that have been launched have been. Um, when they were initially launched, um, there have been images taken where, um, for example, there was one by at Amazing Sky Guy uh, on Twitter, Alan Dyer. Hello, Alan, if you're listening. Might be. Um, he took some images um, right in the dead of the middle of the night. And when Elon initially started talking about Starlink, he said, oh, don't worry about the satellites. You'll only be able to see them for an hour after dusk and an hour before dawn right on the horizon. Otherwise, you won't be able to see them. And uh, Alan has a very clear image of the satellites um, with the asterism of the plough. And they are just as bright, if not brighter than the stars in the plough. Cool. I would argue is not what Elon said would happen. <laughs> at Bruce McCurdy has reported seeing flares at least as bright as Vega. Cool. But then, on the other side of things, <laughs> Will Gator on Twitter has said that most of the satellites are actually now invisible to the naked eye, but very obvious in 10 by 50s. So someone's lying. Well, he then goes on to say that there was lots of flaring to the point of them becoming naked eye visible. So, are these satellites going to interfere with optical astronomy? Maybe. I think the problem is these satellites have been launched and they are nowhere near their final orbits yet. So we don't really know how they're going to affect astronomy. Or, just like when we're at Astro Camp and someone sees a satellite going overhead, will it make people just go, oh, look, satellite there? I think this is the problem, right? Is that he doesn't want to launch like 200 of them 
He wants to launch 12,000 of them. Hmm. There's only 9,000 stars visible to the naked eye across both hemispheres. But can we go back to those altitudes again? Because I think the ones at 340 kilometres are the only ones that you're likely to be able to see, and that'll be very faint. The other ones are going to be far too high for them to reflect enough light. And there's 7,500 of those. Yeah. At 340 uh, kilometres. Again... What are the altitudes of these at the moment? These are in that altitude range, aren't they? And we've got some people saying they're seeing them really bright, and other people, Will Gator, who, well, Paul and me have had conversations with Will Gator in the past, and his credentials are unimpeachable, um, saying that he can barely see them in, well, you can see them in binoculars, but, but barely see them at all with a naked eye. Yeah. So this is the thing, because I think, so all of these comments have been over different days. And so I think the brightness of these satellites is evolving and changing all the time. So I really don't think we truly know the impact that they're going to have on optical astronomy until they're settled in their final orbits. I think I think my just to sort of jump in, I think my my take on this is that this has taken everybody by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's the thing. This is this is so new and so different. Because while we had the um, Iridium constellation, and that's quite famous for being all flares and people track them down and it's, it's all coming out of orbit now, but it was it was a large number of satellites, but by comparison, a tiny number of satellites compared to this. And yeah. I think it's a combination of just, a, 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 I think, an amazing concept and idea. So people are seeing this train of 60 satellites, a line of spaceships crossing the sky. And there's been this kind of mix of amazement and horror, I think, yeah. because this is much, much bigger than anything else that's been seen crossing the sky visually. And then this whole idea mm. of, oh, hang on a minute, it's going to be radio broadcast all over the place and it's going to be beaming down all over the place, not not just directed um, communications at a single dish. This is, yeah. this is stuff beaming all over the place and constantly moving around. But so does Iridium, though. Oh, yeah, because exactly. Iri- but... It doesn't matter where you are on the globe, you are within range of an Iridium satellite. Absolutely. I think if one, th- one thing did not help the exchange this week was, if I'm brutally honest, the extreme arrogance of the man. Yeah, I'll give oh, you that. And no. his replies to to the sort of the questions and the criticisms that have come this week. It and was... ignorance as well. It was a really yeah. bad PR move. Yeah, it then... was. Yeah. But then astronomy is so niche and there's so few people mm. that are involved in it that he doesn't care whether he upsets a very small fraction of the public. No, it, it's an but, interesting one. Yeah. I think I, th- I think the problem is, if you think back to the sort of early 20th century when things like national parks and things were created and they were created because of sort of resource extraction and people were suddenly recognising that we had the level of technology that could, could really, really be quite destructive and therefore to protect the natural environment, various things like national parks were set up. And I wonder if we're getting to that same stage in terms of the sky and Earth orbit, that we've reached a stage now in terms of our, our technical ability and the things we can do, and the things we want to do, like widespread internet access and things like that, where we can actually be quite destructive to the natural environment in terms of the dark yeah, sky and the night sky and things like that. And actually, this is, I think, what we're seeing is the first rumblings, which is kind of an extension of the um, the, the light pollution debate. Well, it is light pollution, if you think about it. In, exactly. But this, this is sort of much further than that, in that light pollution is limited to the sort of towns and cities, and I, I know it's more complex than that, but essentially it's you know, where people live. But there are spaces on Earth where you can go where there's nothing. Mm. This is the idea that actually it doesn't matter where you stand. Yeah. This problem will still be there. You can go to the darkest place in the world, the most remote place in the world, and you'll, you'll still see this. In fact, you'll probably see it more yeah. than if you were standing in the middle of, say, London or Los Angeles or something. And I think yeah. this is part of the reaction that's going on, is there's, there's a great amount of unknown and fear mm-hmm. because suddenly ability, technology, and, and want has, has collided head-on with kind of our, our how we want to view the sky and the natural world and things like that and this is not going to go away this is going to be quite a long debate um that i i can foresee eventually quite large organizations are going to get involved in 
and governments, things yeah. like that, that, that this is going to have to be looked at more closely. Whether there's actually anything in it or not, I think it's the beginning of that, because this, this will only get worse. Yeah, I think I think it really is too early to tell. I think the situation mm. just has to be watched very, very closely. Yeah. Because I honestly think it's really dangerous to have one man in control of the entire sky, which is essentially what he will be. Now, there is a, a comment to end on there. Um I think I think we'll we shall leave that debate open and uh, for future discussion when the more evidence comes in. Not from the stars do I my judgment pluck, and yet methinks I have astronomy, by which I mean it must be the sky guide. So Jenny, what have you got for us? This month. We have a little bit more hope with seeing the planets either in the pre-dawn sky or just after dusk. From around the 4th, Mercury is visible again in the evening sky for the rest of the month and it reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 23rd. And this is the point when it's going to be furthest from the sun, so the safest time to try and observe this overbaked little nugget of a planet. On the 4th and 5th, there are some wonderful conjunctions of Mercury, Mars and the thin crescent moon in the western sky. But... As always with the nature of these things, you are going to need a very clear horizon to see them. On the 4th, Mercury will lie just above the thin crescent moon. And then on the 5th, Mars is going to be just one and a half degrees from the thin crescent moon. However, both these planets are going to disappear shortly after sunset. Still, if you haven't seen these planets before, the crescent moon is a really great marker for you. And as always, take care hunting down Mercury. Never look directly at the sun with the naked eye and only observe the sun with proper equipment. Our Martian Hermian meetups happen again later in the month. On the evening of the 18th, Mercury and Mars will appear so close in the night sky that they'll be practically sitting on top of each other. Imagine being able to view both of these in the same eyepiece. So that's definitely a good challenge for that evening. Ralph. And as for the rest of the large bright planets, Venus never wavers from around magnitude minus four all year. And this month, it's a morning object that will be obvious in the pre-dawn northeastern sky after 4 a.m. from mid-American and European latitudes. The sun rises an hour after Venus, meaning that you'll see it at its best before it really even reaches 10 degrees above the horizon. A telescope or planetary imaging camera will show Venus ranging from 94% illuminated to a nearly full 97% illumination by month's end. Jupiter, however, while a bit of a horizon hugger this month, is on display for a good few hours in the evening from dusk until 3am-ish. It'll be at its best above the southern horizon around 1.30 in the morning on the 1st of June and 11.30pm by month's end. But at 16 degrees above the horizon, at its best, it's not one for the Jovian cloud purists. The changing formations of the four brightest moons in their orbit from night to night, though, are always worth observing. And finally, Saturn reaches the same disappointing altitude above the horizon as Jupiter, 16 degrees when dead south, 3.30am on the 1st of the month and 1.30 on the 30th of June. Despite its low altitude, you should still be able to easily pick out the Cassini division or the gap between the main rings in a 4-inch scope and watch the dance of the brighter moons from night to night. Well, as we're in the deep, bright summer murk and only remotely dark bit of sky is due south about midnight, this month's top object is Messier 16, the Eagle Nebula. Oh, I like this one. Yeah, some good facts here. So who's going to take our first fact? Me. the nebula appears in serpents and is 5700 light years away and give or take 400 fact two this is a region of active star formation and the associated cluster contains at least 8100 stars the name comes from the silhouette in the center of the nebula which is also referred to as the star queen Fact four, below the silhouette is the famous pillars of creation, columns of gas and dust seen up close by Hubble that are forming new stars. And if you have a look at images from WISE, you can see straight through them because it's in the infrared. Ah. And so you can ah. see all the stars that are hidden by the nebulae. Mm. Extra fact there. Mm. 
Oh yeah, that's not my fault. That's like fact four B. <laughs> this is fact five. This is fact five. There is a ninety trillion kilometer long spire of gas erupting from the northeast of the nebula 90 nine trillion yeah trillion. nine and a half light years long that is baby Crucky. i've yeah. got a, a fact 5c and it's one for the astrophotographers that despite it being low on the horizon and looking like it's a smallish object in the sky uh it's a fantastic astro imaging target it really does cut through mm. the the murk low on the horizon and it will fill a sensor you really do get some great detail and you can pick out that eagle in the core um i would definitely recommend it this time of year if you're thinking i'll oh, pack the scope up it's summer yeah no go out and uh and image the eagle nebula it's great it is it is a little bit of astronomy i always moan about the the bright skies but actually it's a little bit of astronomy i always look forward to is that sort of june and july warm evening Late night, drink, cool telescope, beer. looking at the core of the galaxy, just kind of hopping around. Around Sagittarius and Serpent. It's, it's just beautiful around there. Uh, it's just so worth doing. But yeah, you, you never. it's not going to be like middle of December, high, clear skies. But, but it'll be warm. But it'll be warm, exactly. So where are you going to find it? It sits um, in a sort of nebula and cluster-rich area of the sky, as I said, just sort of above the centre of the galaxy. Um, and... The current best way to locate it is to look for Jupiter and Saturn, actually, um, in the south uh, and southeast after midnight. Um, and between them, just above the horizon, you should find the teapot of Sagittarius. Uh, so look above the handle of the teapot, which is on the Saturn side, and locate the less obvious constellation of Scutum. Uh, now find Gamma Scuti, um, which is magnitude 4.6. It's the bottom right star of, of the sort of shield shape, um, or the west side, if you like. Um, and they move about two degrees or four, four moon widths to the northwest from that star and magnitude six M16. You should find it there. It's actually pretty easy to find. You can see it in the finder scope very easily. Um, if you miss, though, you're bound to find something else in this part of the sky because it's really, really busy. So the Omega Nebula is just below it. Um, and there are dozens of nearby clusters and sort of nebulosity and things. So you, you won't you won't be kind of disappointed even if you, you initially miss it and you, you won't get that frustrating. Like, ah, oh, I can't find anything. You'll find There's something. loads. There's yeah, loads, there's loads of, there. of good stuff there. Good, good. Pour, pour yourself a scotch and, and sit and enjoy the evening because it's, it's a great way to look at the sky in the summer. <laughs> okay, so what do we have in the deep sky, Jenny? Well, summer solstice this month. So the sky doesn't truly get dark. Maybe you've got an hour or so where it's pretty dark in the middle of the night uh, at the start of the month if you, you know, want to be pedantic about these sort of things. So, as a result, I am bucking the trend, and I'm not going to suggest a deep sky object this month. Mm. Ooh, controversial. Ooh, I know. The, it's the deep sky section. What, what are you... Go on, what are you going to do? Instead, have a go at not to loosen clouds. Oh, so you're mm. not even going solar system, you're going atmospherics. Not wow, even that, going that, solar system. That couldn't be going less deep sky. Going atmospherics while you can <laughs> before Elon, you know, ruins them. That's, that's <laughs> like the least deep sky object ever. I'm going for phosphorescent algae in the water. <laughs> I'm going for the Mariana well, Trench. Have a look at a glowing sky instead. Now, <laughs> now Karen, honestly, we're taking the this time of year around the solstice is the opportune time to try and see them, um, because they're only visible during astronomical twilight, and it's at this time of year where astronomical twilight is the longest. Mm. Mm. So, while the sky is bright, give them a go. Now, these clouds are some of the highest possible clouds. Um, they are some 80 kilometres up in the atmosphere. So they are really right at the edge of our atmosphere. They're thin, wispy clouds, and they're made of ice crystals. And to see them, you need to be in the darkness, but have the upper atmosphere still illuminated by the sun. That's why around the summer solstice is the best time to see them, because you can be in the dark, but the atmosphere is still lit up. So to find them, look to the north, around sunset and what you're looking for are wispy clouds um in the part of the sky that's colors a very distinctive sort of electric blue color and that electric blue color comes from light being absorbed by ozone if anyone's interested the clouds can appear wispy rippled streaked even have some whirls in them and they are great big massive structures like really stretching across the sky like once you see them you'll know what you're looking at 
your best chance to see them is if you occupy a latitude between 50 and 65 degrees north or you know equivalently south if it was six months later um this is because at these latitudes the angles between sort of you and the sun and the earth all just kind of hit that sweet spot ralph well, as Jen says, it's summer and that means limited quarry for deep sky hunters this month. So instead of pointing you to the biggest and brightest open or globular clusters, I'm going to suggest you enjoy the sight of Elon Musk's new train of 60 satellites. Ooh, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> this is just for you, Jen. Oh. <laughs> Boo. You, <yeah>. Boo. <laughs> You're just going to say that over, <laughs> over everything now, are you? Turn away, don't look, don't listen. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> Ignore the man talking rot. <laughs> how can you find how can you find this train of sixty satellites, Ralph? Well, should you want to find this train of sixty satellites, <laughs> and by Jove you shall, you can find the passing times for your location on the ny20.com or Kelsky websites, and there should be an addition to the satellite plugin for Stellarium any day now. Um before the SpaceX launch, there were more than 100 satellites you could already see with a naked eye on any given night. So these are a very minor addition. But grab them <laughs> now because they will go out of naked eye visibility when they get into their operational orbit. And you won't be able to tweet your indignation at something so trivial at that point. Well, <gasps> until trivial? the other 11... 12,000 <laughs> satellites <laughs> are nothing <laughs> trivial, Ralph. Uh, uh, the- hold, hold your horses, Jen. That is until the other 11,940 satellites in Hugo Drax's Starlink constellation get lofted. All Most right. of them at much lower orbits. So brighty, brighty. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you're an astrophotographer, however, your hobby's over. So sell your kit and buy yourself a gold 69 Corvette Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Probably so f- the least inspirational sky guide we've done. <laughs> To finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with new on the 3rd, first quarter is on the 10th, full on the 17th, and last quarter on the 25th. So, clear skies and happy hunting. Doubt, though, the stars are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt the truth to be a liar. But never doubt that this show ends. All good things must come to an end. Bad ones too. It's a shame because I felt we were really starting to connect. Can we still be friends after all we've been through? Can it ever be the same? We still smile when you think of us. And do get involved in the show by sending us your astronomy or space-related thoughts to read out at the beginning of the show or questions to answer on astronomy or space exploration by sending an email to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. If it sparks a debate or gets us excited, it goes in the show. And remember to leave us reviews, good ones on, you know, all the places that people see, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever. Bad ones, please send them to at Elon Musk on Twitter. <laughs> or put them on a toilet wall or something. Yeah. Um, so until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission.